you very much, Don, for such kind words and particularly for the exhortation uh, to pray for me because uh, that will be much appreciated. I've already mentioned that to a few of you uh, today because certainly in my position there are many situations where I am uncertain of what the Lord's plan is uh, for me as far as the role that I'm to play as the director of this project with such enormous importance. Uh, I do feel in many ways that this is my calling, that after uh, many different chapters in my life that I weren't, wasn't quite sure where they were going, uh, I can look back now and see that they all sort of fit into preparing for this particular activity. Uh, and I'm grateful to the Lord that he showed me that, even though I wasn't quite sure he was right when this particular call came along. <laughs> I guess I'm one of those molecular biology missionaries uh, that Chuck Colson talked about last night. Uh, I can certainly tell you that in the environment where I spend most of my time, that is the scientific community, uh, there is not a large fraction of individuals who uh, are willing to even discuss uh, the notion of faith because it makes them uncomfortable. I actually think uh, there's probably uh, more possibility than most people realize uh, to talk to scientists about faith, but in general, it is a topic which makes them sufficiently uneasy that it's difficult to get that first conversation going. Uh, I know for me, the American Scientific Affiliation, and Don Monroe is here from that organization, has been a source of uh, considerable encouragement. Uh, that is a group of scientists that have gathered together uh, to uh, advocate uh, in, a, in a very articulate way uh, that one can, in fact, uh, promote the scientific method and believe in rigorous approaches to understanding our world and at the same time recognize uh, that the faith uh, that we all adhere to in that organization is the most central part of our lives and that there's no intellectual discordance between those uh, two statements. Uh, and it is reassuring uh, to gather together and, and uh, talk to each other about that when you do feel like you're in the minority a lot of the time. Um, I must say this has been a very energizing co uh, a conference for me. I got here uh, in time last night to listen to the presentations. I was very moved by the two patient uh, presentations, folks who came and talked about their experience uh, with some very difficult decisions and uh, challenges and information that landed on them. And certainly I have spent many hours as a physician in the genetics clinic talking to families placed in those terrible situations. Uh, and I think that was a very appropriate place to start this conference. Um, my own background, I don't usually sort of go into this, but it sort of seems to me in this particular venue, it would be appropriate for me to be a little more personal than usual. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about my own history before I begin uh, to go into the science of the Genome Project and some of its consequences. Uh, I grew up in, in a uh, home, uh, a farmhouse actually in Virginia, uh, and the home I grew up in was uh, nominally Christian, but I think uh, nominally is putting it fairly generously. Uh, my parents thought it would be good for me to go to church to learn music, so I went to church and I learned music and that's all I learned. And when I got to college and my own uh, sort of very vaguely uh, understood ideas about faith were challenged by those around me, uh, they quickly crumbled. And so I went from being sort of uncertain to being uh, fairly strongly and vigorously atheistic uh, for about 10 years of my life. Uh, during those 10 years, I got an undergraduate degree in physical chemistry. Uh, I really had no interest in biology at that point. I went off to graduate school to get a PhD in physical chemistry and then got very troubled that perhaps this really wasn't what I was supposed to do. It didn't seem to sort of have that sense of contributing something that I was looking for uh, in terms of particularly medical consequences. I don't know why I thought by that path I was going to end up in that route. Uh, so I had to do a little bit of uh, self-evaluation and in great disarray and not quite sure what I was going to do, decided to go to medical school to keep my options open. Uh, why the University of North Carolina was willing to admit a medical student under those circumstances, I'm not quite sure, uh, but they were very uh, tolerant. And I did discover in that first few months of medical school this thing called medical genetics, which immediately appealed to me because of the simplicity and elegance of the DNA molecule and of the uh, great mysterious sort of uh, wonderment that I felt at perceiving that small changes in this very complicated molecule could have profound effects on human health. And I also had this clear sense that a revolution was just beginning to get underway and that would be a lot of fun to be part of. Uh, 
Still, however, at that point, uh, I was outspokenly atheist. Uh, only as a uh, house officer in internal medicine did I begin to feel uncomfortable with that stand. I had the chance to take care of patients, many of whom were dying, uh, who had terrible diseases that they had done nothing to bring down upon their own heads. And clearly those who had a saving faith in Jesus Christ uh, seemed to approach this very differently than I would have and that many of the other people that I cared for did. And I got very curious about that. It seemed as though this was something more than a psychological crutch, which is what I had called it for a decade or more. And some uh, thoughtful person said, you know, if you're going to uh, try to make a decision about faith and you're a scientist, maybe you ought to sort of approach it from an intellectual point of view and see what are the arguments pro and con. And that had never occurred to me that there might be arguments pro and con. I thought you just sort of had it or you didn't. Uh, and I was directed to the writings of one C.S. Lewis. And I suspect many of you in the room have also had this experience of opening the pages of mere Christianity and realizing that many poorly formed vague ideas that you had uh, have been laid out in really precise detail uh, by this incredible thinker and child of God uh, that C.S. Lewis was. And by the time I got to the end of that book, I realized that all of my uh, presuppositions about what faith was about were really quite off the mark. Now, it took me another year of uh, wrestling with this, uh, of reading the Bible, uh, sometimes with uh, great intensity, sometimes feeling like, oh, this isn't going to work for me. Uh, but eventually, after that year had sort of uh, reached the climax, I was compelled. I could not have resisted uh, the desire uh, to give my life to Christ, uh, which I did uh, now some 19 years ago. And that, of course, came at a time that I was already committed in my career to medical genetics. So this is the answer to the question which some of you have asked, how could a Christian go into medical genetics? <laughs> So really, it's how could a medical geneticist become a Christian, because that was the order of events. But I honestly believe uh, that uh, in God's timing, uh, there are no mistakes. And this has actually uh, worked out in a rather remarkably interesting fashion. Uh, as a medical geneticist, uh, now with my faith to help guide me, it certainly seemed to me that there were questions that now had answers that didn't before uh, when it came to the suffering of a child or an adult. Uh, I began to understand uh, that, in fact, uh, the absence of all suffering is not necessarily achievable or even desirable, uh, that God has a plan, even in the terrible sufferings that happen all around us. And I found myself praying with patients on occasion and crying with patients on occasion and uh, talking to them about John chapter 9. Uh, some of you may know the story of Christ being brought uh, a child who was born blind and the disciples reflecting on the uh, thinking of the day, saying to Christ, so who sinned here, the child or its parents, that this child was born blind? Because those seem to be the only two options uh, in the current uh, philosophy. And you may remember Christ's response, which was neither. No one sinned. Uh, the child was born blind so that the glory of God might be manifest in him. That, I think, is... Uh, profoundly important revelation, and certainly one which has given great comfort to parents struggling with the question, why did this happen to my child? And things will continue to happen uh, to people's children. Uh, we will not be able to turn this back. We will not be able to uh, end all suffering, even uh, through the advances that are ahead of us, nor do I think we should plan on that. I have a wonderful uh, quote from my old professor of medicine, which is, uh, he, he always got, got amused at me because I tend to be a little idealistic and to imagine that we will find cures for all diseases. And he would say, Collins, you got to realize the death rate is always going to be one per person. <laughs> got a point. You may exit this way or you may exit that way, but you're going to exit. And uh, sometimes we almost forget that, don't we, in our rush to be enthusiastic about advances in medicine. Uh, I believe very strongly in the Christian mandate uh, to be a healer. Uh, maybe we could have the lights down a little bit and put up the first slide, which I think appropriately is a scripture verse. And this, uh, let me get the changer here. 
Well, that's pretty dark, but I'll uh, read it to you in case you can't read it. This is from Matthew, and it's uh, actually a verse that you find a couple of times in Matthew. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness, listing three activities, one of which is healing. Now, surely, if this is something which Jesus Christ in his short time on this earth spent so much time on, it is something that we were intended to notice and something that we in our puny efforts uh, to try to imitate Christ ought also to try to imitate. That is the theological justification for the Human Genome Project. This is a natural extension of our desire to heal the sick. That is the reason why I think this project is so exciting. That's the reason that I feel ethically and morally it is totally justifiable because it will have outcomes of that sort. Having said that, I know that there are also plenty of precedents for potentially beneficial medical advances uh, being used in unethical ways. Uh, after all, uh, man's propensity to sin is ever-present. And that potential for misuse then requires all of us to take responsibility for making sure that these medical advances are used in a way that benefit people rather than injuring them and which follow moral principles rather than the reverse. And I think that's what we're really here gathered in this remarkable conference to talk about is how shall we achieve that? Uh, when I come to the end, I'll have sort of a, a series of exhortations, uh, but just to preview, one of them will be not uh, to any more try to claim uh, that we should just stop doing this research. I think that would be the most unethical thing of all because within this kind of medical research is held the seeds of healing which we are exhorted to do. So that's really a non-starter, that's not an option. However, uh, having said that, the burden of responsibility uh, to make sure uh, that this information is used in the most moral fashion is quite heavy. Uh, this morning uh, we heard a quote uh, from uh, J Jim Watson, Arthur Dyke uh, was uh, referring to uh, Watson's statement that scientists and physicians could be counted upon uh, to provide that kind of vigilance. I actually don't know the source of the quote, and having talked to Jim, I suspect that he would uh, argue that he didn't really mean it that way, that scientists and physicians have a role to play, but this is not something which they alone uh, can handle. Uh, in fact, I suspect most of them are uncomfortable with the idea that they are entrusted with that responsibility all by themselves. This has to be something which we, in a much broader sense, take responsibility for with input from all segments of society whose lives are going to be affected by it. Um, let me just say a word about scientists in general for those of you who don't bump shoulders with them. I think most scientists when it comes to the ethical implications of genetics are not particularly uh, interested in uh, having the power to make those decisions. They are most worried that somebody will make some rash decision which prevents them from doing their research, uh, which they believe in the value of. That they are anxious about that. But I don't think they seek to be in control, particularly. I think most of them would happily go back to the lab and do some experiments. Although I will tell you that the Human Genome Project has been uh, an interesting experiment in combining ethics and basic science. And when we have a genome meeting, we always try, if we can, to set up a session on the ethical, legal, and social issues and it is always packed uh, with these basic scientists who have a great hunger, in fact, to hear these things discussed uh, and to perhaps make some contribution. So they're interested, but they are very insecure about their abilities necessarily to guide this process. Um, I might also say that most scientists uh, are not off the wall like the ones that were quoted uh, in the last day and a half. I guess I hadn't realized until coming to this meeting just how many notable, many Nobel laureate uh, winning uh, scientists uh, have, after completing their productive scientific work, turned into eccentrics prone to make really bizarre statements. <laughs> so uh, we heard today from Wilson and Crick and Watson and Brenner and Daniel Cohen uh, statements that would make your hair curl, they made mine curl, and I was left with the fear that you might think that that's in fact the majority view in the scientific community. And I'd like to reassure you that it's not. I can't tell you that mine is the majority view either, but I think I'm actually a little closer uh, than some of those that you heard quoted uh, earlier on. If that's reassuring, fine. If it's not, that's okay too. Okay, well, 
that was sort of by way of introduction of who I am and where I came from. And now what I want to do is to get into some of the facts of what genetic science is up to and what the Genome Project is all about, what uh, its course has been. And I'm going to try to tie this as much as I can to specifics because uh, I think that will help our dialogue. And I, I want to try to get done with what I want to say by 8.30 or a little past so that we can have time for a uh, serious interval of questions and answers because that would be, I think, uh, very uh, useful and, and worthwhile. Uh, I tend to be a little ambitious and in preparing this talk, uh, I started out with about a hundred things that I wanted to tell you and even if I spent two minutes on each one, you'd probably not be happy when we got to the end. So I had to trim back substantially and so I'm hoping you will bring up some of the things I didn't talk about in the questions and answers. Uh, but we'll see how it goes here. So, perhaps beginning uh, with uh, some uh, basic background. Is that slide at all legible to you in the back? Is there any way to turn the lights down any more than they already are? An attempt is being made. Uh, well, for starters, Genetics has been traditionally viewed, I think until fairly recently, as that branch of medicine that is devoted to the study of relatively rare disorders. And it's only in the last uh, perhaps uh, 10 years or so that we've begun to have the confidence that we might be able to apply those same strategies to understand hereditary components that contribute uh, to many other diseases that are not inherited in such simple ways. Ooh, that helps. Yes? This slide is basically put up to, to make that point that virtually every disease, except perhaps trauma, has a genetic component. Now don't overestimate uh, what I'm saying here. I am not saying that every, ge every disease is predetermined on the basis of genetics. I'm saying that every disease has a hereditary contribution and in fact I'm attempting in these pie diagrams to uh, portray what that contribution is as the cross-hatched version. So for something like cystic fibrosis, where the disease comes about because a child has inherited a misspelled copy of the responsible gene from each parent, a child in that situation, if the misspellings are the severe type, will almost certainly develop cystic fibrosis. But the severity of the disease may not be quite identical between kids who have the same genetic constitution. And why is that? It's because the environment also plays a role in determining exactly how the disease plays out. So even for a disease like cystic fibrosis, there's an environmental contribution. When you get to something like diabetes, which I'm using here as sort of an example of a long list of the common diseases that afflict us, and that includes heart disease and hypertension and breast cancer and prostate cancer and schizophrenia and on down the list, it's clear for all of those that there are genetic contributions because they tend to run in families. What runs in your family? Probably one of those things on that list. And yet at the same time, you cannot understand those diseases in a simple one gene fashion. And that means that when somebody says to you the gene for diabetes or the gene for alcoholism, they're not really accurately describing the situation. There will not be the gene for any of those things. There may be a long list of genes for those complex disorders like diabetes, each one of which makes a rather mild contribution and the sum total of those then adds up to what your risk is and yet you still may not get the disease if the environmental contribution doesn't come to pass. That sounds messy, but that's the way it is. For most of the diseases that afflict us, you cannot understand them or predict them as precisely as the media tends to portray. That does not mean, however, that studying their genetics is going to be fruitless. Quite the contrary. If you can identify, catalog, understand those genes that play a predictive role in diseases like diabetes, you will undoubtedly come into a better understanding of the disease that will lead you to new treatments that we couldn't have thought of otherwise. So while I don't in any sense wish to have you go out of here thinking that Collins is one of those people who says that everybody has a crystal ball if we're about to peer into and it's going to tell you you're going to get sick at age 46 and a half uh, with colon cancer, that's not the case. But I am going to argue that finding out what those genes are that play this predictive role is a very useful activity and that it will save lives in some circumstances and benefit humanity and it is part of our mandate 
as Christians attempting to emulate Christ in his healing role. Even a disease like AIDS over here on the right, uh, which you probably sort of recoil from and say, now wait a minute, that's caused by a virus. Are you going to disagree with that? And I'm not going to disagree with that. But in fact, it now is clear that two individuals exposed to the same dose of the virus may not have the same outcome. And in fact, the host factors, your immune system, for instance, uh, which is genetically encoded, will play a significant role in whether or not that individual gets ill in a very short period of time or survives for a long period uh, without symptoms. We heard last night a very wrenching tale uh, of the mother with a child with hemophilia talking about his exposure to the AIDS virus and the fact that blessedly he remains without symptoms after a number of years where many of his friends have died. Uh, this kind of variation uh, is likely to have some genetic basis. And it would be useful to understand that too. Even though we will not cure AIDS probably by that, we might learn how to uh, manipulate the situation in a very positive way. So genetics and the environment are always sort of working uh, together, or sometimes not working together, uh, to create or not create a disease. And we are probably treading on thin ice to neglect one in order to emphasize the other. Yet, it turns out, understanding the environmental contributions of disease is very difficult. We are at a time, however, where understanding the genetic component is becoming possible and in fact possible on a very rapid timetable. Interestingly, one of the consequences of this genetic revolution is going to be to understand the environmental con contribution better because it's what's left after you understand the genetics. And we've never had the ability to make that distinction. Now, if something is genetic, that means that somewhere in the DNA molecule there is a difference in the sequence of those base pairs between the people who are susceptible and the people who aren't. And just to remind you, this elegant molecule, this double helix that you see diagrammed here uh, spilling out of the nucleus, is the information carrying molecule of all living beings. In the human, its uh, information capacity is reasonably well defined. We have a fairly good idea how much DNA there is. And in fact, I would ask you, if you don't already know the answer, to try to guess what would be the amount of DNA that you would need to specify all the instructions that your body has to carry out biologically from the time of being a one-celled embryo, which you all were, uh, until being here now doing all the things that you have to do. I mean, that's a lot of information. And the information has to be encoded in this very simple molecule, which has just four letters in its alphabet, A, C, G, and T. So how many of those letters would it take to write the instruction book? that you would need to specify the biological properties of a human being. I guess before I knew the answer, I would have thought it would be an astronomical number, an almost uncountable number. And the fact that it's three billion is, while that's a big number, it's, it's an imaginable number. It's not something you can't conceive of. And the Human Genome Project is devoted to the idea that that number is in fact knowable and that we will have, some seven or eight years from now, that entire instruction set written down and in a publicly available database where anybody who wants to try to understand it can do so. Uh, that is a phenomenally uh, significant event in the history of humankind, that we would have this opportunity to go in and look at our own instruction book and print it out. And we're engaged in that activity. And it will change us, I think, in philosophical ways and in medical ways and in other ways that maybe we haven't quite yet imagined. Now, I don't mean to overdo this here. I put this slide in partly to be provocative, but I also put it in to remind me to say something to you that I feel rather passionately about, and that is that the work of a scientist, uh, particularly a scientist who has the joy of also being a Christian, is, is a work of discovery which can also become a form of worship. As a scientist, uh, I must say, one of the most exhilarating experiences you get is to learn something, to understand something that no human understood before, but God did. And to have the chance uh, to see that, the glory of that creation, the intricacy of it, the beauty of it, is really an experience not to be matched. Uh, that means, uh, to me, a great deal more than the experience that must 
perhaps be uh, uh, gone through by those who don't have that perspective. I'm sure they're enjoying themselves too. But to have the joy of discovery mixed together uh, with the joy of worship is truly uh, a powerful moment uh, for a Christian who's also a scientist. Now, the DNA is not uh, arranged in a, in a chaotic mess inside the nucleus. It's organized onto chromosomes. Oops, we seem to have had a life of our own event here. Uh, <coughs> these uh, chromosomes you see here are from a normal male. And how do I know that? Well, down in the, uh-oh. <laughs> the slide projector doesn't like normal males, I can tell. I'm trying to move on. Uh, down in the lower right-hand corner, there's the sex chromosomes, and there's an X and a Y, so this is a male. Now, on those chromosomes, there are about 100,000 genes. Now, a gene is simply, we're fighting here, uh, the, a gene is a packet of information, a stretch of DNA that codes for a particular instruction. <laughs> now, the challenge, I know you're not doing this, not your fault. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the challenge to the geneticist is to try to figure out which gene goes with which disease. 100,000 genes, probably close to 100,000 diseases if we really knew how to catalog all of them. How do you figure out which goes with which? And that's not trivial. In fact, that is the major reason to do the genome project is to make that easier. Now, let me give you an example. Let me try to give you an example. Uh, this is a, uh, doesn't like that one either. Hmm. Uh, you stay there. Okay, this is an a, a example. This is the cover of Sports Illustrated, and some of you who are familiar with New York City may recognize uh, the uh, quarterback here on the front, Boomer Esiason, the quarterback of the New York Jets. And do you know what the disease is that afflicts uh, his son here sitting on his shoulder? Cystic fibrosis, the most common disorder of Northern European background Caucasians. One in 2,500 newborns have the disease that Gunnar Esiason has, namely CF. And Boomer must be a carrier for that because this is a recessive disease, so in order for the child to be affected, both parents must carry an abnormal copy of the gene and they must have both passed on that copy to the child. And we would very much like to cure this disease. This is a terrible disease for kids and young adults to live with. The problems associated with it are largely in the lungs, the mucus that normally is smoothly cleared out of the lungs, carrying with it uh, bacteria and dust that you've inhaled. And cystic fibrosis is thick and sticky and it doesn't move uh, materials out and you end up with recurrent infections, eventually destruction of lung tissue, and average death is at about age 30. Now, that is a disease which one would like to have the ability to come up with some radical ideas about how to treat and cure. But in absence of any more information than what I've just told you, it's very difficult to know what to do. So it was very important then to try to identify this gene. This was accomplished prior to the Genome Project. In fact, what you see on this slide occupied uh, the major part of my own research efforts in the 1980s, and it's very daunting that you can put it on one slide when it took so much time to accomplish. Okay. So what was it that we did to find this gene? It was, in fact, uh, a rather daunting idea. You're starting out with those three billion base pairs and you've got to find the right gene. How do you actually do that? It seems counterintuitive that it would even be possible, doesn't it? Well, the idea is, first you go out and you find families in which the disease has occurred, and then you need a collection of what we call genetic markers. This is the hardest part, so uh, in sort of pay attention here. If you get this part, it'll be smooth sailing from here on out. So what's a genetic marker? A genetic marker is a bit of DNA that varies from one person to the other. Genetic markers are the same things that are used in forensics to try to fingerprint individuals. But you can use them in this genetic analysis to basically track inheritance in a family. So you can see that this child must have got that copy from the father and that copy from the mother. Now, if you have a marker which is on a different chromosome than cystic fibrosis, and you test these families that you have collected, the marker will have absolutely no predictive ability to tell you which kid got CF and which didn't because chromosomes segregate independently, as Mendel noted some time back. And that's the usual rule. And most of the things that you try are going to be like that because you don't know when you start out which chromosome to look on. But if you test enough of them, and enough is hundreds, you should eventually, by chance, hit upon one that's next door to the cystic fibrosis gene. And when you do so, you will notice that that marker tends to predict which kids have CF and which don't. 
And if that's happening, it must be nearby on the same chromosome. That's the hardest part of this, is that first step. Now, once you've done that, you've got it on the right chromosome. In this case, it was chromosome 7. Then you narrow the region down by trying to pick other markers in the vicinity until you've got a more or less manageable interval, say, a couple of million base pairs. That's not great, but it's a lot better than the 3 billion you started with. And then you have to sort of sift through that interval, which probably contains something in the neighborhood of 20 to 50 genes, looking for the right one. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, how do you know when you've got the right one? You're in the right vicinity, but there are all these genes, and you're looking at them. How do you know which one is the cystic fibrosis gene? Well, it actually is rather simple. If this is a gene that's responsible for a disease, there has to be a misspelling in it in the people with the disease and not in the people who don't. So you're looking at the end game of all of this for some letter or letters gone awry in this code. And the next slide shows you what, in fact, we found a very subtle change. After 10 years of work, it all came down to these three base pairs. A CTT, which is normally present in people who do not have cystic fibrosis, was, de was deleted in about 70% of the cystic fibrosis chromosomes. Now, it's not 100% because it turns out, uh-oh, the other uh, individuals uh, with this particular uh, disease have other misspellings in the same gene. Uh, maybe you could back up. Thank you. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, the finding of this alteration then proved that we had the right gene. Now, does that matter? You can leave it right there. Go ahead and go forward. Maybe if you make it go forward, it will decide it doesn't have to by itself for a little while. Uh, this uh, diary entry, which I think is a fairly touching one, is written by a little girl on the day that the cystic fibrosis gene identification was announced. It says, today is the most best day ever in my life. They found a J-E-A-N gene for cystic fibrosis. And this girl, J-H, was eight years old at that time, and she is now 15. So this, I think, m in a very poignant way, makes it clear that at least for this individual, that gene discovery was felt to have some positive consequences for her. And this is, after all, the justification for doing this in the first place. However, I have to point out that that does not happen overnight. Uh, people, uh, especially in the news media, sometimes even confuse finding a gene with curing the disease. There are many, many steps uh, in between those things. In fact, the next slide is sort of worth looking at. This is sort of the flow of molecular medicine. If you can see it, I'll, I'll try to describe it if you can't quite. At the top, you start out trying to understand a disease. Then using those markers that I talked about, you try to map the gene to its appropriate place on the chromosome. And then you narrow the region down until you've actually cloned the gene, and that's what's in the middle. And every time you get to the end of one of those arrowheads, it's a pretty big deal, and everybody gets excited. So when you read in the New York Times or uh, the Chicago Tribune or whatever you're reading that something really exciting happened in molecular medicine, it's probably because somebody came to the end of one of these arrowheads for an important disease. That really is, seems to be enough to get you in the paper. But now, the consequences of that are what comes after that. Finding the gene is the end of the beginning, as Churchill would say. It's not really the end. And here is where we often get into dilemmas. Because finding a gene by this process gives you, whether you like it or not, diagnostic capabilities. How do we find the CF gene? We found it by identifying a misspelling in most kids who have the disease. That means the next day, if we had wanted to, we could go out and try to identify who has that misspelling. After all, this is a disease that's recessive. I told you 1 in 2,500 kids have the disease, but 1 in 25 Northern Europeans are carriers, like Boomer Esiason, and most of them don't know it. So there are probably several carriers in this room. If I set a booth out uh, after this lecture and offered to do a carrier test on you, would you want to know? I suspect you'd have a lot of questions before you'd uh, sign up for that. Like, why would I want to know? What's it going to do for me? And you should have questions. Uh, but that diagnostic capability technically exists almost at the moment of gene identification. Now, what you really want to see happen, what I really want to see happen, is further down in the chart normally. That is, using the gene to identify a strategy that will allow you to do something for people with the disease that's more 
successful than what has been available previously. And if that's a gene therapy, that's great. And if it's a drug therapy, that's great too, as long as it works and it doesn't have terrible side effects. Now let me say, for cystic fibrosis, there's a lot of excitement about gene therapy because here's a disease where if you could put the normal gene back in the lungs, not in the germline, just in the lungs, you should theoretically be able to correct the disease because all you need is one normal copy of the gene to be okay. That's the way carriers are. Yet that has turned out to be quite a challenge technically and while more than 100 cystic fibrosis patients have gone through clinical trials of gene therapy for this disease, uh, none have been cured as a consequence. In fact, the results in many ways have been a little disappointing because the vector that's being used to deliver that normal gene turns out to produce an immune reaction in the host and so you get a very short-lived effect and then the, uh, the uh, gene therapy, basically you can't tell you did it because the immune system has fought it off. Uh, that maybe was predictable, but it is a bit disappointing and I think realistically it will be several years before we have a sense whether gene therapy is going to pay off for CF in the short term or not. Of course, drug therapy is an alternative and not to be sneezed at, I worry that in fact the media, at least in the past, have been so positive about gene therapy that they've tended to imply that's the only benefit that comes out of gene discovery, whereas in fact for many diseases, I think the pathway that will get you where you want to be in terms of a therapy uh, will be the one on the right there where you understand the disease well enough as a consequence of having the gene in front of you to be able to then design a drug that's really uh, more, much more specific than the largely empirical approaches which we currently take. Okay, next slide. And I just want to point out that even for a disease like cystic fibrosis where you may imagine that most of the diagnostics that are going on are used for prenatal purposes and are used in fact to warn couples of the birth of a child with CF which they may, may then decide to terminate, that in fact that's not the case, that most of the CF testing that has been done has not had that outcome. And I'll just tell you very quickly here about an example of that. Here's a, a family, those of you who haven't looked at pedigrees, the squares are males, the circles are females. Uh, the uh, square that's down here on the left, which is filled in, is an individual with cystic fibrosis. That means that both parents must be carriers. It's a recessive disease, that's how it works. That's why I've marked those as half filled in. And then this couple down here in the right is wondering what does that mean to us? Are we at risk of having a child with CF? Now the geneticist looking at this pedigree could go through the calculation and say their risk is not terribly high because while the father, the square there with the circle, with the uh, question mark in it, uh, has a risk of being a CF carrier that's fairly high, two thirds to be exact, uh, the uh, woman, the circle over there with the question mark in it, has no family history of cystic fibrosis, so her risk of being a carrier is one in 25. And when you go through the calculation, you end up with this one in 150. Yet that is not an insignificant risk, particularly if you have had the experience of living in a family where this disease has occurred and can appreciate its severity. And so this couple basically had decided not to take the chance of having a child because of that kind of a risk. With the identification of the gene, it was then possible to go through and specifically identify whether or not the husband and wife were carriers for this condition even before they had initiated a pregnancy. And the outcome which uh, came forward was that they clearly were not at risk and therefore, next slide, they had the opportunity to bring this baby into the world. And I, I, I hope you get the sense from this story and many others like it that genetic testing in the main is actually used even in the prenatal setting uh, to reassure couples and actually to allow, in many instances, the birth of children that would not have been able to come about. It is too simple uh, to stand up and claim that genetic testing is only being used in a search and destroy mode to try to root out defective fetuses. While that does happen, I'm sorry to say, in, in greater numbers than any of us uh, might be comfortable with. In fact, there are many outcomes of this sort that are quite different. Next slide. Um, I just want to quickly run through um, a couple of sort of reality slides here uh, to make the point about just how big the genome is and therefore why we need a genome project to do this. I said three billion was not that big in the estimation of what it might have been, but it's still a big number, three billion. Even in Washington, D.C., three billion is a big number. Uh, 
So what is it really like to try to find a three base pair deletion as we went through for cystic fibrosis when you start out looking at three billion? So you're trying to find a one in a billion problem. What is one in a billion like? Next slide. Well, it's like this. You're looking at a young man on a picnic in a park a few miles down the road here in Chicago. He's right in the middle, middle of that picture. But you, even if you're sitting in the front row, you can't make him out because this picture is taken from a sufficient distance away that he occupies one billionth of the field of the photograph. That's okay. And that's just like looking at these chromosomes and trying to see the cystic fibrosis mutation. So if you were trying to find the boy in the park or trying to find a mutation that causes disease, you'd figure out some way to sort of move in on this. So next slide, we'll do this. In fact, we'll do it quickly. <coughs> we move in by a factor of 10. Now you can see the right planet. That's like saying CF is on chromosome 7, another. Now we're down <coughs> to a mere 10 million fold problem here. That's like saying CF is in the middle of the long arm of chromosome 7. You probably can't quite see Lake Michigan. Here we are down another factor of 10 to a 1 million fold problem. Uh, this is about as far as those markers will get you and see how far you still have to go. You can maybe see the lake. Down another factor of 10 to 100,000 here. You're actually now looking at the right gene because genes are big. But you don't know it's the right gene until you find that very subtle change in it. So you have to keep going. Down to 10,000. Chicagoans are probably recognizing some parts of this down to 1,000. Well, there's the park. Uh, there's Soldier's Field and down to 100. Yeah, here he comes, down to 10. <laughs> One more, down to the guy. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> so every time the geneticist sets out to try to understand a disease, they have to travel through these nine orders of magnitude. And that's really tough if nobody has mapped the interval for you and you have no geography to guide you. So that's the point, uh, next slide, of the Human Genome Project, is basically to make this process doable for the thousands of diseases that afflict us. Cystic fibrosis was in many ways an easy one compared to, say, diabetes. And without this kind of map and sequence information, we would just never get there for most of the diseases that we'd like to understand. Next slide. Now, the Genome Project has three very simple goals. And having gone through the process of finding a disease gene, I hope these will make sense to you rather quickly. <coughs> we wanted genetic maps, we wanted physical maps, and we wanted the sequence. The genetic maps are those markers. And we wanted to have lots of them, because if you have a disease gene and there's not a marker near it, you might miss it when you do all this work. So we figured we needed about 1,500 of those scattered all over all the chromosomes. And the Genome Project, when it started in 1990, uh, aimed to have those 1,500 markers by the end of 1995. And I'm happy to tell you we had them by the middle of 1993. And now here in 1996, we have over 10,000 of those markers. So we have a terrific genetic map. That part of the Genome Project is a done deal. The physical maps are what you need next once you've sort of got it narrowed down uh, to that part of the geography where you know the gene must be. You'd like to then possess that DNA and to be able to look around and see where the genes are and try to see which one might be the right one. And for that, you need a physical map. And the physical maps we thought would take us until the end of 1998. And here we are in 96, and they are 96% done. So this is also likely to end up at a good year or two ahead of schedule. But the really hard part is to get those three billion letters worth of sequence. Uh, that part has largely, up until now, been devoted to studying the sequence of simpler organisms like bacteria and yeast and fruit flies and roundworms because their genomes are much more manageable. And the technical advances that were necessary to allow you to do three billion base pairs of human DNA had just not come along. But we encourage them, and they have now come along. And as of three months ago, we began in earnest the business of sequencing human DNA. And the expectation, next slide, is that this will, in fact, uh, succeed in reaching the original goal of getting all of the sequence by the year 2005. In fact, the way things are going, I think it's fairly likely that will be done by the year 2003. So here we have. Believe it or not, a federally funded project which is ahead of schedule and under budget. <laughs> That'll get me into the door of almost any member of the Congress. 
after that, I have some fast talking to do because they're worried about, okay, that's great, but where's it going to lead? And of course, that's why we're all here. And by the way, dealing with the Congress is an interesting experience. About half my time uh, in, on, uh, on some weeks, it seems to be involved with talking with members of the House and the Senate. And some of those people, I'll have to tell you, are real saints. They're people of great integrity and honesty and drive and determination uh, to serve the people that they represent. And some of them are complete jerks. And uh, there's all sorts in between. And some of them seem to be living in outer space. And I really uh, fretted about this the first uh, year or so I was there. And then one day I passed a newsstand in the 7-Eleven, and it all became clear to me. Next slide. Did you see this issue of the Weekly World News? <laughs> Seems that way to me sometimes. <clears throat> sometimes I think if we added the alien to the genome project, we'd get better support out there. I'm sure they're <laughs> interested in that one. Uh, you know, in fact, living in Washington is not something that I had exactly planned for in my own life. And there are days where it seems like the craziest place on earth. I ran across the cartoon that you see on the next slide in the New Yorker, which uh, I thought I'd show, to you, show it to you. So it's these folks dancing around in hell here. And the guy is saying, on the other hand, it's great to be out of Washington. <laughs> it does feel that way sometimes. Uh, so the Genome Project uh, is basically, to give you a report, uh, going along scientifically extremely well. Uh, we are meeting or exceeding the milestones. The genes that are being discovered as a consequence of this uh, are dizzying in their number. Hardly a week goes by that there's not a new discovery of this sort. And obviously, the medical consequences of that are now hurtling forward. We don't have to wait for this project to be done for those things to find their way into practice. And the question is, well, what kinds of things, and should they? So let me tell you about a specific example. I am going to try, uh, in the remaining minutes here, to focus on things that I perceive as being particularly present now and try to steer us away from some of the more out there kind of scenarios, which while they may be fun to kick around and sort of gets everybody's gastric juices flowing, uh, are not perhaps nearly as realistic as some of the ones which we are facing right now, where I think uh, real engagement on the part of all the parties that might have an opinion here would be appropriate. So the next slide introduces the topic of breast cancer, which I think is a very powerful paradigm. Uh, for, for what is happening in molecular medicine. This cover of Newsweek shows a three-generation family, the grandmother having had breast cancer. Her daughter at 29 has undergone a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy because of her deep concern that she's at high risk for breast cancer. And the cover is asking the question, what about the next generation? Will we have something better by then? What's the story here? Well, next slide. A gene for breast cancer called BRCA1, I'm saying a gene, not the gene, uh, was identified in 1990, it was mapped, and then the gene itself was precisely identified in 1994. If you are a woman with a misspelled copy of BRCA1, uh, next slide, and you're from a family uh, of the sort as this, one more, forward, uh, your risk of getting breast cancer is really quite astronomical. It's about 85% lifelong. And it's 50% by age 50, so it's an early onset type of cancer. Women of this sort are not uncommon. In the general population, about 1 in 500 women are in this situation. In the Jewish population, it's 1 in 100. It may be even as much as 1 in 50. Now, should we mount a crash program to go out and find those women and warn them of this risk when you consider this very high likelihood of developing cancer? Obviously, the answer to that uh, at some level comes down to how would it help to know? Are you just going to give people news that they have to walk around with, or are there interventions uh, that could be offered, drastic or otherwise, that would improve chances of survival for somebody in this very high-risk category? Uh, we don't quite know the answers to that. But let me tell you about a family. Next slide. Now, here in this particular pedigree, uh, the women um, and the men are, uh, as you can see, drawn as symbols instead of circles and squares. So you can figure out who's related to who. And you can see that there's a number of women here who have been afflicted with breast cancer or ovarian cancer, uh, and some of them at a very early age. There are women here with breast cancer in their 30s and their 40s, and one woman with ovarian cancer as well. 
Okay, imagine now that you are the woman in the lower right with the purple arrow. Maybe you could move that slightly to that side, just push the projector so it, yeah, that's good, so I can see it as well. Uh, what's it like to be that person? Her sister has uh, had two episodes of breast cancer, one at 36, one at 39, is currently getting chemotherapy. Her other sister had breast cancer diagnosed at age 35 and died at 36. Her mother has breast cancer. Her aunt had breast cancer, survived that, and then died three years later of ovarian cancer. So from her perspective, every single one of her first degree female relatives has had this disease, and many of them have died of it. So she's convinced that she's gonna get the disease as well. She's thought about that every day for the last 10 years. And she actually, in desperation to try to do something about that, scheduled herself for a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy, like the woman on the Newsweek cover, figuring that that was her best bet to avoid this terrible disease, because she's now 37 and her sister's already had cancer by then. Um, she also was participating in a research project, and with a rather uncanny bit of timing, three days before she was due to have this prophylactic mastectomy, it became clear from the research project who in this family had the misspelled copy of BRCA1 and who didn't. And by some uh, grace of God, she walked into the clinic unannounced to, to let us know that she was planning to go through this surgery, which we had no idea about, and asked whether or not there was any new information that might change her decision uh, in those three days before she went through with the procedure. And literally 24 hours before the results had come through, and I will now tell you the people in blue don't have the gene and the people in yellow do. So she had not inherited the altered copy from her mother. She'd inherited the normal copy and her risk of breast cancer, while it's not zero, it's the same as an average woman's would be, it's certainly not the very high value that she thought it was. So we were able to tell her then that her risk was not so high and she canceled the surgery and we had a very exciting positive experience in the clinic that afternoon and she went home. And the next day she called up and she said, I've never felt worse. I feel so guilty. All these people in my family that have suffered and many of them have died from this and I had this bond with them because I was at risk too and now you've taken that away and while I'm happy for myself and I'm happy for my daughter because I know she's not at risk now either, I'm miserable for the rest of my family and I feel like I can't talk to them anymore, and I feel somehow like it's my fault, that I'm responsible. That is not an uncommon reaction. It may seem a little bizarre uh, to you if you haven't thought through this through, but it is not an uncommon reaction. It's called survivor guilt, very similar to the experiences of some people who have survived the Holocaust. That woman took two years of very intensive counseling to sort of work through that, which makes the point that genetic testing in the absence of counseling is not necessarily doing people a favor. Even for those who get good news, they may need some support, and she certainly did. Now, other outcomes can happen. I think you'd agree in that situation that at least medically, this was a good thing. She didn't go through a drastic mutilating surgery that she otherwise would have experienced, and she is relieved of this anxiety, and she doesn't have to worry about her ovarian cancer risk, and her daughter is also uh, pretty much in the clear. But what about the woman over here in the lower left? Well, you can see she's marked in yellow. That means she got the gene, but she didn't know that. She got it from her father. Men can carry an altered copy of BRCA1 with relatively little in the way of consequences. Uh, they may have a slight increased risk in prostate cancer, but not much. So she had no idea that this was really relevant to her. She knew vaguely about her cousins and her aunts but she didn't think that really applied to her. They were too far away in the family. Nonetheless, she participated in this research project and wanted to know her status and came in expecting to get good news and instead had to be told that her risk of getting breast cancer is 85% and at her age of 40, there's a significant chance that she might already have it. So she asked to be worked up and a mammogram was done the same day that she got that result and in the middle of this picture, there's a sort of white density which to a radiologist is an alarming looking lesion and that was biopsied and it's cancer. So this woman went from thinking she was at low risk to finding out she already has cancer in the space of 24 hours. What's she to do? Well, tough decisions here. <clears throat> she had to figure out what to do to treat this cancer. She needs uh, procedures for that. She's got a risk of ovarian cancer as well. 
Her decision was to go through with bilateral mastectomy and also to have the lymph nodes on the side of this lesion looked at. They were negative, that's the good news. Her chance of being cured of this cancer are about 95% because it was so small and it was picked up so early. A year later, she had her ovaries removed because of her concern about those and her decision that she'd already completed her family. But these are tough decisions. These are not the sorts of things that you sort of drop information in somebody's lap and say, go away and think about this and let me know what you want to do. This takes a lot of back and forth of questions and answers and counseling. And I don't think at the present time we necessarily are very well set up to do that on a large scale. Now, in this situation, I wish I could also tell you that she did the right thing. I don't know. There are disturbing examples of women who went through bilateral mastectomy and still developed cancer years down the line and a small amount of tissue that remains after that surgery. Same with the ovarian surgery. It is not a guarantee of freedom from cancer in the future. And we don't have good statistics on exactly how much value is derived from these sorts of surgeries. So we are really in an early stage of knowing the appropriate use of this kind of pre-symptomatic testing. And that is why many of us feel, in fact, that it would be inappropriate to begin to offer this as part of the primary care practice of medicine outside of a research protocol, because we really don't understand the benefits and the risks yet. Uh, Sophocles knew this. Information of this sort has value if it helps you, but if it doesn't profit you, then it's but sorrow to be wise. Uh, this is, I think, a very worthwhile quote. Uh, Ecclesiastes has another way of saying it. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. A uh, rather depressing sort of statement. You can always count on Ecclesiastes to lift you up, right? But <laughs> <laughs> just the same, I think, in this particular instance, there's some truth to this. Do people want genetic information about which they can do nothing? We can, by the way, predict risks of Alzheimer's disease at at least a reasonable level at the present time. And yet many of us think it would be most unfortunate if that kind of test began to be offered out there in the uh, clinical arena because it will only be a statistical statement. Well, your risk is a little higher or a little lower, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Uh, so why uh, voice that on people? The Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Program, which is what I'm going to finish with because I'm running on here, uh, is the part of the Genome Project that's devoted to wrestling with these issues of where is genetics going to take us and do we want to be there? I have to say at the outset uh, that I do not believe that the Human Genome Project per se introduces any brand new ethical dilemmas that weren't at least hinted at in times gone by by the whole field of human genetics, which did, wasn't just born yesterday, but has been around for a while. But what the Genome Project does do is to accelerate the rate at which these discoveries are occurring, and therefore the numbers of people whose lives are going to be affected, which will eventually extend to all of us. We are all walking around with four or five genes that are really fouled up, and another 10 or 20 or more that are moderately altered in a way that's probably not good for us. There are no perfect genetic specimens, lest any of you imagine that that's the case. Uh, in fact, this is sort of the biological parallel of the fallen state of man. Therefore, if we do not have a set of protections in place, so the genetic information, when it comes to the detection of uh, alterations that aren't good for your health, uh, if we don't have protections in place to prevent that being used against people, we are all at risk. None of us can afford to turn our heads and assume that that's not going to have an impact on us. The ELSI program, to which 5% of the budget of the Human Genome Project has been devoted since its outset, has been looking at a long list of issues. The four top priority ones are listed on this slide, and I'll quickly go through a few examples of where we are with those. But to talk about the ELSI program in all of its uh, complexities would keep us here quite a long time. So I'm just going to hit a couple of high points. Here's another pedigree that I just would use to introduce what many of us perceive as the most major important priority issue right now uh, where something needs to be done and where I believe uh, the church uh, could play a very useful role. This pedigree, which is back in squares and circles, uh, you can see the woman down there in the lower right-hand corner is 40 years old, and she has an aunt with ovarian cancer and a cousin with breast cancer. And the aunt and the cousin, again, turn out to have mutations in BRCA1. And so this woman at the age of 40 came to see us in the clinic at the NIH 
seeking information about whether or not she should also be tested in order to decide uh, whether or not she should go through some intense surveillance or even consider surgery. And after hearing all of the uh, reasons why or why not to go through this, uh, she decided not to be tested. And I'll tell you for one reason and one reason only. Uh, she was a federal employee but was getting ready to leave the government and go into her own consulting business and would have to get her own health insurance. And she was quite concerned that if she had this test and it was positive and that information fell into the hands of her insurance company, she would be uninsurable. And she's right to be concerned uh, because there is absolutely nothing to prevent that. Is this just? Is this ethical? To have a health care system where DNA sequences that you had no choice in selecting can be used against you to take away your health care coverage. For some people, that's a lethal event. If you're in this situation where you need mammograms on a regular basis and you can't afford them, and your health insurance company is making it impossible for you to get them, that could be a lethal event. And yet we are allowing that at the present time by turning our heads to a system which is set up in a way that discriminates against people on this basis and others as well. And I believe that's a top priority that we as Christians cannot be silent on. If you believe that health care is not something that should be reserved for the privileged few who have wealth and resources, but rather something which should be available to anyone with those needs and should not be capriciously taken away because they don't happen to have the right DNA sequence, then I think you have to get energized about this issue. Now, I'm happy to say there is some progress being made, not enough. The cartoon here says, apparently, I'm genetically disposed to pay high premiums. Uh, several states have passed legislation to make it improper or illegal for, genetic, for health insurance companies to use genetic information to deny coverage. But many of those don't prevent the setting of exorbitant premiums, which is effectively denying coverage anyway. In the federal government, there are no less than eight pieces of legislation that have been introduced in the House or the Senate on this topic, but none of them have passed. And with the current sort of stagnated state that uh, precedes a presidential election, it doesn't look too promising that any of them will pass in this session. And even if they did, they are far from the uh, really robust kind of protection that one would hope for. So this issue is winnable, but it's not won yet. And I would love to see Christians uh, stand up and speak about this in a passionate way, because I believe this is a topic that we should all feel passionate about. Uh, this is another cartoon. At the bottom it says, very nice resume. Leave a sample of your DNA with my secretary. <laughs> uh, employment discrimination, also a serious issue. Uh, can employers use genetic information to deny you a job or to pass you over for a promotion? You bet they can. There's nothing currently to very effectively pre prevent that. There was a ruling, as reported in this uh, much ignored uh, uh, piece of uh, information in the New York Times about a year ago, the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission did say that using genetic information to deny somebody a job is illegal. But there are various loopholes and problems with that particular ruling. So we have not solved this one either. And I think that's certainly a high priority to do something about as well. Uh, there's the whole business of patenting. This cartoon says, marry me, Virginia. My genes are excellent and as yet unpatented. And uh, given the lateness of the hour and the fact that I think you heard a very excellent presentation on this topic by Steve Sherry this afternoon, uh, I'm not going to get into patenting unless people want to ask questions about it, except to make one point. Patenting is really an issue where I think it's uh, tempting to get off the track very quickly. Uh, the patenting of intellectual property uh, is a complicated issue that involves ethics, it involves legal uh, terminology, it uh, involves various practical matters. And I'm afraid that in general, uh, when the church has spoken on this issue, it has not done so in a terribly well-considered way. One year ago, Jeremy Rifkin, uh, that Pied Piper of environmental causes, succeeded in what I would call hoodwinking about 80 religious leaders to sign on to a document which decried the use of patenting when it comes to organisms, uh, life forms, organs, tissues, genes, cells. They were all sort of lumped in there together. In fact, that was the problem with the statement. The statement was constructed in such a fashion that it was essentially, essentially meaningless. It became a vehicle for Mr. Rifkin to promote his own personal agenda. Uh, it is rather astonishing that Rifkin, 
who has made it very clear in most of his writings that he worships no god that we would recognize, but rather if worshiping anything, it is nature that he is devoted to. The fact that he was able to convince a number of very well-intentioned leaders of the religious community to uh, get on board with a statement which was at best useless and at worst seriously damaged the church's credibility. That is a troubling outcome. We really have to, I think, preserve uh, the opportunities to comment meaningfully on these very important issues, and that is not well served uh, by signing on to a document which is highly emotional and really flies in the face of the factual information. I know I'm speaking strongly here, but as a Christian, that was a black day for me a year ago when the church that I care so much about uh, signed on uh, to this particular document in a way that I think became uh, a laughing stock in the scientific community. It became an excuse to consider the church irrelevant because if the people in the church could not perceive this issue in any more sophisticated way than this, and if they could not perceive the motives of this particular individual as being antithetical uh, to faith, then what relevance does the church have? The church has so much to contribute here. That voice needs to be heard so badly. We can't squander those opportunities uh, by ill-considered statements, which sound perhaps at the most superficial level as though they are righteous in their indignation, but as soon as you look beneath that, they are basically irrational. We have to not let that happen again. Okay, I'm coming to a close here. I guess the final point, and I really am running over, but I hope you will still be willing to stay and ask a question or two, uh, becomes the business of the overuse of genetics to explain everything. And we've heard much about this uh, during the course of today about are we more than the sum of our genes, and I would certainly emphatically say yes, and I think we all have to guard against uh, opportunities where we slip into this kind of determinism. Uh, this cartoon says, the good news is that you will have a healthy baby girl, the bad news is she's a congenital liar. <laughs> now this is intended to be funny, I hope the cartoonist knew just how ridiculous this was, I suspect so, or it wouldn't have gotten published, but this wasn't supposed to be funny, this is Time Magazine. Did you see that? Infidelity, it may be in our genes. This is ridiculous. How many people walked by the newsstand in the secular world that week and said, oh, good, I thought it was me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we should stand up and, and speak with one voice that this is really not the way things are. Uh, even in the, uh, the literature coming out of the church, this comes from a journal called The Clergy Journal. A spiri spirituality gene, is it possible? And the writer is asking in a very well-intentioned way, is it possible that the reasons that some people are more interested in faith than others is because they have a spirituality gene? Yes. I don't think that's right. In fact, I'm sure that's not right. Uh, we really have to guard against that kind of oversimplification. Maybe you could turn the slides off, and I just want to summarize. Now, I have not this evening perhaps talked about some of the areas that many of you find the most unnerving about genetics, the designer babies. I could do so, but I think those uh, scenarios in general are very unrealistic. Instead, I've tried to focus on the things that are here now where we really need to pay some attention, and the church, I think, has a very important role to play. So as I close here, I guess I would like to present five challenges uh, to those of you who are here. You are going to be in a position, I think, uh, to exert leadership in this area as you go back to your usual place of work and uh, share the information that you've learned. The first challenge, get informed. Pick real scenarios if you're going to have your debates there's a verse from uh, Proverbs, which I'm fond of, although it sounds uh, perhaps a little assertive. Proverbs 19, verse 2, it is not good to have zeal without knowledge. I believe the church is the place where zeal is often expressed in its most effective form, but only if it's backed up with that kind of knowledge that allows it to have credibility. While genome is not a word I can find in my Bible, I believe there is much guidance in there about the appropriate steps to take with this information. 
but it has to be sort of grounded upon an understanding of some of the scientific facts. And I think we have to resist the temptation to focus on scenarios which are really quite unrealistic. Second uh, challenge relates to that. Resist that temptation to take emotional cheap shots. Uh, passion is okay, distortion is not. Uh, if you are in a position of talking about genetics, talk about the issues that are real and don't instead sort of slip into the Frankenstein scenarios uh, which are much easier to put forward because they get everybody stirred up and it's easy to put up a straw man and then shoot him down. Uh, third, and I think I said this at the beginning, advocating that genetic research should be stopped is a non-starter. It would be the most unethical thing to do when the hopes of many individuals, perhaps all of us in some way, of escaping from some significant medical illness depend upon this kind of research. Can you really ethically argue not to do it? On the other hand, having that information uh, forces you to take responsibility for how it should be used. Fourth challenge, maybe this is the, the hardest one. I don't think it's enough anymore to outline the dilemmas that genetics poses. Many of the presentations at this meeting have been of that sort. Well, have you thought of this one? Suppose this happened, and then the conversation sort of ends. I think we've had those discussions now for four or five years. Uh, I think we probably know fairly precisely what the dilemmas are, and it's time to move on to the solutions. And I would exhort all of you to try to do that, hard as it is. Uh, if the church is going to contribute to those solutions, the time is now. It is not enough to simply come up with sort of titillating scenarios that make everybody uncomfortable. We have to figure out what to do. And it is already time to participate in the solutions to some of the early problems, like the health insurance one. And finally, fifth challenge. Remember that you are representing God Almighty. To the extent that you speak with reason and with love, and I'm talking to myself here too, then God is glorified. If we are not, he is not. I think Colson said this last night very well. We are people of love. Uh, and that is how our case will be won or lost. And I'm not sure that has always characterized our conversation uh, when it comes to some of these very emotional issues. I guess my prayer uh, for all of us is, as we heard earlier today, uh, that we find wisdom uh, earlier today, we heard a quote from Proverbs. My favorite quote on wisdom is from James. This hangs on my wall, uh, decorated in beautiful calligraphy by my daughter. This is James uh, chapter 1, verse 3. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men freely and without reproach, and it will be given to him. I claim that promise for all of us. And I exhort all of us to go out there and seek what God will provide. Thank you very much. really on time, and I think that it, uh, in all fairness to our speaker and his uh, distinguished career, that we can go until 9.30 if, uh, if that's your wish. It's a democracy. <laughs> I'm so impressed that the Word of God in the Old Testament is diagnostic, but in the New Testament, we find the therapeutics for man. And it's the same way with the Gene Project. Uh, so much of what we're talking about here is diagnostic, and the real challenge is in the therapeutics of what we have to do. First question, please. Uh, Russell Lenz, uh, Dr. Collins, I just want to thank you so much, and also the uh, Trinity for putting on this uh, conference. Uh, tonight, uh, this, this weekend, uh, after having been in 
biotechnology and biochemistry and molecular biology for 25 years. This has done my heart more benefit as a Christian to know that the, the man who's leading the effort in the human genome research trusts in the Lord. Thank you very much, and I'll do my earnest to pray for you on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you. Gee, I hope they're all questions are like that. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> Johnny Ramirez, Loma Linda University. My question is very simple. Are we assuming or do we know that the gene remains stable from the zygote to death? Or is it to be understood that perhaps the genes could be mutated or changed in the process of life? Certainly, if you take cancer, uh, as we now understand it, cancer is a consequence of mutations in genes that accumulate during life. Occasionally, like BRCA1, you're even born with one that's already mutated, but most of the genes that get mutated in the process of going from normal to cancer uh, occur as a consequence of some misspelling that happens during your life. So in that particular situation, we're learning a lot about the instability of the genome. There are certainly other normal circumstances where genes change. Uh, the immunoglobulin genes that are responsible for antibodies have to rearrange during life in order to give you the vast array of antibodies that you need in order to fight off various infections. So that's a well-programmed, very elegant system uh, to be able to use the DNA to its maximum capacity. Uh, there's much suggestion that the process of aging may come about as a consequence of an accumulation of mistakes in DNA, not the kind that cause cells to grow out of control like cancer, but the kind that causes cells to become sick and not able to divide when they should. So it is undoubtedly the case that your DNA is somewhat plastic. It is changing, and that probably accounts for a much longer list of diseases than we currently realize. Dr. Collins, my wife and I are parents of a child with a chromosome disorder called Prader-Willi syndrome. Yes. And uh, we attended a conference uh, here in Chicago nearly a year ago, and there's a couple of geneticists who talked about how this particular syndrome is kind of revolutionizing genetics here right now, and I was wondering if thought you might be able to relate to the rest of us how that is impacting the genetic yes. world. Yeah, Prader-Willi syndrome is uh, not a common, but it's not terribly rare either, a genetic condition caused by an alteration of chromosome 15. Uh, some individuals with that problem are actually missing a small piece of chromosome 15. Uh, but in others, it seems that what's happened is they've inherited two copies of that chromosome from one parent and no copies from the other parent. And you wouldn't think that would matter normally because two copies are two copies. But what Prader-Willi has taught us is that things are not always quite what they seem. And there are genes which, if you inherit them from your mother, they may be turned off. Whereas if you get that co same copy from your father, it may be turned on. That's called imprinting. And Prader-Willi is the best example we now have of that phenomenon of imprinting. Uh, the hope would be that that kind of revelation will lead us to understanding what goes wrong in this frustrating condition, which is characterized uh, by a tendency to gain weight at a rather dramatic rate. After being born very floppy and having trouble feeding these kids by age uh, one or two, if they're not in some way put in a special environment, will tend to gain weight very rapidly. Uh, they also often have learning disabilities and a variety of other problems. Uh, all of that uh, it m is very difficult, I think, for parents to sort of cope with, and the hope would be that this revelation about the mechanism, which is a very surprising one, uh, may lead us to a better understanding of what to do. But as I guess I pointed out in that diagram, the timetable between understanding at the mechanistic level and being able to intervene is a very unpredictable one. Yes? Scott Ray, Talbot School of Theology. Uh, you had mentioned that the EEOC has declared it illegal for, em for employers to use genetic information to discriminate against employees. Could you specify, without getting into too much of the legal lingo, some of those loopholes yeah. that allow employers a way out of that? Yeah, th you might wonder, how, why is the EEOC getting into this? Uh, well, it comes about because the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed about five years ago, uh, in fact, has the EEOC as the government agency that is to interpret what it means. 
Now, the EEOC's argument, which I think was a clever one, uh, is that an employer who decides not to offer a job to somebody who they had tentatively planned to offer that job to because they find out that person is at risk for some future illness, that employer is regarding that person as disabled even though they are currently healthy. That's the argument. It's a bit of a stretch, uh, but they use that argument to say, therefore, the Americans with Disabilities Act kicks in and you can't do that. Uh, that has not been tested in the courts. There are certainly some legal authorities who think if it is, it will not survive because it is a little bit of a stretch. Nonetheless, I'm, I'm happy to see that it's there because perhaps it is discouraging some mischief. But you see how limited it is? It really just looks at that circumstance uh, where somebody has been given a conditional offer of employment and then a little more information comes in and the employer decides, oh, I don't think I want to hire them anyway. Uh, it does not cover people who are already on that job and where this information comes to light and the employer then decides they want to get rid of them, uh, which is a major area of concern. Uh, it doesn't cover some specific area of genetics like recessive diseases either. We're actually having a conference in October inviting a number of uh, experts from Capitol Hill who've been much involved in this issue, as well as experts from the legal profession and the medical profession and consumers to try to design some recommendations about what should be done about employment discrimination uh, that would extend beyond this EEOC uh, ruling. And there are a number of members of Congress that have indicated an interest in introducing legislation on this topic next year, and we'd like to be able to provide them with the right language so that if something does get introduced, it actually solves the problem. There was one employment discrimination bill introduced actually a month ago uh, by uh, a, a member of the House. Unfortunately, it's really a terrible bill, uh, sort of misses the point. And this, this is part of the frustration sometimes of living in Washington is that there are well-intentioned efforts to try to do something about some of these issues by people who really don't have the background to know what they're trying to do. And yet, somehow, they don't just ask. <laughs> You'd think that would, what would happen, but it doesn't always happen. Yes. I'm, I'm Lee Campbell. I'm a neuroscientist and chair of natural sciences at Ohio Dominican College. I guess the concern I have is for what happens in terms of public perception. First off, uh, I think when Bloom and Nelson's work came out on alcoholism and the pedigree analysis of behavior that they had, that correlated with certain forms of alcoholism. Uh, they called a press conference to announce that. The next day, the front page of the New York Times said, alcohol gene found. Um, and later, Bloom sort of complained in the American scientists that he was being misrepresented. But the initial correlation was very tentative. And, and it, it sh I, I don't know why he called the press conference. I guess I don't want you to answer for him and his choice. But my concern is that this sort of thing happens a lot. Uh, a poll I heard about shortly after that held that 60% of Americans believed there was an alcohol gene, alcoholism gene. Mm. And um, there's a sort of responsibility that as scientists we have to very rapidly decry that sort of depiction, some of which has to do with the press, some of which has to do with us. And uh, the reason why I think this is a concern is not just because of public misinformation for its own sake, but the fact that it drives public policy. And so I think in your position, uh, there has to be some very forceful ways to stand up and say that is not what it says and, and offer sanctions against that. The same thing would be true for Hammer's work with the so-called gay gene. Yeah, I think it's a very serious issue, and it's too easy to always point the finger at the press and say, well, they're making a big deal out of something that was really quite tentative. Uh, the press does do that, mind you. Uh, and the press is in a tough spot. I mean, a, a reporter who's trying to write a story will always be motivated if it's good to make it terrific and if it's bad to make it just awful because uh, that's how you get attention and that's what the press is all about. A and at some level, I'm not sure how one deals with that other than trying to educate the reporters that are going to be doing this over and over again about what these observations really do mean so that they can report them in a responsible way. I spend a fair amount of time talking uh, to reporters about discoveries, and I would say two-thirds of the time when I get a call from a reporter, at the end of the call, I convince them not to do a story on something that they've heard about because it's too uncertain or the way that they're spinning it is going to be too misleading. I do believe, though, scientists contribute uh, to this misrepresentation on a regular basis. And I sort of understand, and maybe at some level I'm even slightly sympathetic with why. I mean, if you're a scientist that has worked on an obscure problem 
for 15 years of your life. And finally, you sort of come out of the clouds into the, the meadow and you make this observation that you're sure is right. It's very exciting and it's hard not to sort of be excitable in front of the press and perhaps feed into the press's tendency to overstate the issue. I think we have to discourage scientists from doing that. I think many of them understand that, but not all of them. Uh, and, and they do contribute uh, to sort of the overblown representations of what these observations really mean. And then people are going to get just jaded uh, and say, oh, you're going to tell me that? Well, the last time you said that, that turned out to be wrong. I mean, look at the iterations we have gone through, painful ones, in understanding the genetics of schizophrenia and manic depressive illness, where we've had all these ups and downs. I mean, look at this field. In the last year, we have now finally, sorry about the pun, we, <laughs> we, uh, we have finally in the last year got rather definitive evidence for genes on chromosome 18 and chromosome 21 that are involved in manic depressive illness and a gene on chromosome 6 that's involved in schizophrenia. But nobody even wants to say it out loud because it's been wrong every time before. And I think the public probably doesn't even know that this time it's right uh, because the press are afraid to report it. We're all afraid to say it out loud and the public wouldn't believe it if we did. So we kind of dug ourselves into a hole. Yes. Dr. Collins. Vicki Markson, and I'm a student here at Trinity, and I'm concerned about genetic testing. Uh, how can we in the Christian community prepare people for genetic testing? Because it seems to me that that is coming, and some people might even be forced into some genetic testing for their jobs or uh, as part of a, some distorted prenuptial agreement or something. Yeah, I certainly uh, share your concern. I think the idea of testing being done on an involuntary basis, uh, so far we haven't slipped into that, although certainly some insurance companies would like to have that information before they decide whether they're going to cover you or not. And that's getting pretty close to involuntary. Even if they ask your permission, you're not going to get covered if you don't agree. Uh, there are a number of uh, fora where these deb debates are being held, and again, there are people here tonight uh, who are involved in those discussions, I think, in a productive way. Uh, but on a much more personal level, I think anybody who's involved in pastoral counseling is going to find these issues walking into their office. I think we do need to mount an effort in the Christian community to prepare pastors and lay counselors uh, to deal with uh, these issues. Uh, because people are going to be seeking counsel about should I have this test or not, or I've had this test and it says I'm at this risk, uh, what should I do? Uh, I think those things are going to be happening fairly quickly. We had a recent conference uh, at the, in, in the Washington area about a month ago called the Genetic Self, which was specifically designed to try to provide this information uh, for social workers and family therapists and pastoral counselors. So about a third and a third and a third of those groups came and it was wonderfully interesting, and I think the people that were there went away quite inspired to try to spread some enthusiasm for uh, acquiring those skills uh, in the pastoral community. But we've got a lot of work to do, and I think uh, the, the organized church ha now probably has a, a strong mandate to try to provide educational opportunities and materials uh, to people who are looking for them, and some of the churches are starting to do that in a, in a very effective way. Uh, but I agree, we need to look at this. I didn't mention, by the way, uh, Either today or maybe Monday, the National Bioethics Advisory Commission is supposed to be named. This is a presidentially appointed commission. This is the first time that a bioethics commission has actually uh, been uh, in, uh, in force now for about seven or eight years. There have been such commissions in the past. Some of them have been more productive than others. The primary motivation behind setting this one up has been the feeling of Senator Mark Hatfield of Oregon that there are a lot of issues uh, here that need attention. Senator Hatfield is a uh, very devout uh, evangelical Christian. Uh, if that commission uh, is successful, uh, that will also provide a public forum uh, for discussion of many of the issues we're talking about at this meeting. So I would really encourage all of you to keep your eye on that. Uh, learn what they're doing. If they have an opportunity for public comment, which they will probably have on the issues that they're deliberating about, uh, and you have an opinion, uh, speak up. Uh, I don't know the membership of that commission. It has not been announced. Uh, 
I wouldn't be too optimistic that there will be a majority of Bible-believing Christians. <laughs> in fact, I'd be amazed if there were any, but <laughs> you can always be hopeful. A and it will be a place, I think, where a lot of uh, discussion will be productively held. Yes? Jill Abernathy from Fairfax Hospital. I have two hopefully easy questions. Um, I am in an area where the breast cancer gene testing is available by a private group, and so I'd like to follow up on Vicki's question. Actually, I have two questions. The first is, if we do want to do some education, do you have any specific materials that you direct us to? I know there have been some good articles in the New England Journal a couple of years, years ago, but do you have anything you specifically recommend? And the second question is, there are some of us who would be interested in helping um, do whatever we could to get some bills through Congress. The difficulty is tracking those bills and figuring out which one of the bills is well written and perhaps also is politically expedient so that it would be mm -hmm. the one that should be supported. Does anyone track those and how could you find out what's the right one to push for? Mm -hmm. Both good questions. Yes, uh, the company you mentioned, I can't resist making a little editorial comment about, the Genetics and IVF Institute uh, in Fairfax, uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., uh, has broken ranks uh, with virtually every other laboratory and offers BRCA1 mutation testing uh, to uh, Jewish women uh, who have this particularly high risk and in whom uh, the alteration that you need to look for is much better defined than it is in other populations. Uh, so for $295, you can go to Genetics and IVF Institute and have a BRCA1 test done, which they say is associated with some sort of counseling, but I suspect it's fairly rudimentary. They are doing this in the face of published statements from a variety of organizations, uh, including the American Society of Human Genetics and the National Action Plan on Breast Cancer and the National Breast Cancer Coalition, a consumer group, saying that this is inappropriate, uh, that this is not ready yet uh, for that kind of application. It should only be done as part of research. And yet there are no sanctions that currently can be applied uh, to a renegade company of that sort. Uh, that company is uh, arguing that they are in fact providing women with information that they might be interested in having and that the rest of us are being paternalistic by taking the stance that this should only be done as part of research. Uh, to which I reply, if that's the case, how come all the consumers are saying it shouldn't be done outside of research? Surely they're the best judges of who's being paternalistic and who isn't. And of course, Genetics and IVF Institute is making a profit on this. And yet, uh, there has not been, uh, at the present time, a mechanism put in place, as there is, say, for drugs, uh, to prevent the premature release of genetic tests into clinical practice. And I'm quite troubled about that. I believe that genetic tests have some similarities with drugs. They have benefits and they have toxicities. If you have a genetic test and the result is wrong and you make some decision that you later regret, that was a toxic event. And yet, we don't sort of consider that information in the same vein. There's a task force on genetic testing, which uh, was sort of spun off of the LC Working Group, which is our policy body uh, within the Genome Project, which has been deliberating for the last year and produced a series of uh, principles, and we'll follow that up with implementation in the next six months. And it will be very interesting to see whether this task force recommends that FDA get involved in a much bigger way in terms of certifying whether or not laboratory tests are ready to leave research and go into clinical practice. The alternative is that sort of professional practice guidelines are entrusted with these responsibilities. But where is the enforcement uh, if that's the case? It's not clear. Uh, the example you refer to, I think, is very troubling because here you have a for-profit laboratory which is basically going against the recommendations of almost all the groups that have looked at this, and yet there is no way to prevent that. Uh, this company is not exactly being shy about it. They're advertising in all of the Jewish newspapers around the country, trying to drum up business. I find that deeply troubling. Um, so we will have to see, sort of when the dust settles, what mechanisms will exist uh, to try to prevent that from happening. The second part of your question about how you get information about the bills, that, are, that is actually very difficult. You sort of need to be hooked into an organization that's tracking those. At the present time, I would say the organization that's doing the best job of this is the breast cancer activist community. They are incredibly uh, keyed into this because of their perceptions that breast cancer is going to be the first one out of the gate here. And many of them come from families with many affected individuals, and many of them are concerned that they have this mutation. 
And so they have been doing a very effective job, I think, of being uh, effective advocates and also tracking what's going on. There's this federal-private uh, uh, partnership called the National Action Plan on Breast Cancer, uh, which has been tracking these things rather vigorously, and that would be a good place to go. And I can speak to you afterwards about how to uh, sort of get in touch with them. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I've come over from Liverpool in England largely because I heard you were speaking on the project and I wasn't oh in any way disappointed. Um, I'd just like to ask you to elaborate a bit further on your comments on prenatal diagnosis and pre-implantation diagnosis in the light of some things that are happening in England. Um, recent surveys show that 92 to 95 percent of people who are told that they're carrying a child with Down syndrome are choosing therapeutic abortion. And simultaneously, in the Hammersmith Hospital in London, we've now got an IVF institute that's doing pre-implantation diagnosis, and they're actually testing for 28 different genetic weaknesses, um, 13 for immediate problems and 15 for proclivities, um, or things that will cause problems later in life. Given this, we're very concerned that once you've got multiple genomic sequencing, the IVF clinic in the Hammersmith will simply plug an expert system into its computer and will run the genome sequences of the pre-implantation embryos. It'll become more and more difficult to qualify for the right to spend nine months in your own mother's womb. And I just wondered how you could square that with your, I, I don't want to overstate the case, but quite defensive comments, I feel, on prenatal and pre-implantation diagnosis. Well, that's a very good question. I think the hardest part of these dilemmas about the appropriate use of genetics is in the prenatal arena, and I didn't mean to skirt that unduly because I think that is an area where there is no consensus. Uh, when you talk about the ability to identify genetic predispositions and you're talking about an adult who can then benefit from that information by reducing their risk, it seems like a generally good thing if you can keep that information from being used against them. But if you take that same setting and you apply it to the prenatal arena, as people are proposing to do for BRCA1 and other things, then I think it makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck uh, when you consider applying this kind of diagnostic uh, to, for the prediction of an illness which may not strike until uh, late adult life. Uh, have we moved uh, too far uh, over in the direction of looking at things that are much less certain and even in some instances more like traits than like diseases. Sex selection is a troubling example, and, and uh, we do not at the present time have any preventive measures in place in the U.S., nor do I understand there are in Britain, uh, to keep this uh, technology from being used to choose the sex of the fetus. And I think many of us are troubled by that. Uh, sex is certainly not a disease, it's a trait, and yet there is technical uh, reasons why it's very simple to do that. Uh, this, this is the toughest problem. Where do you draw the line in that infinitely series, uh, infinite series of gray steps between serious, terrible disease over here, anencephaly or Tay-Sachs disease, and something like being a male or a female over here, which is a trait, in the application of these methods in the pre-implantation and prenatal state? I think actually uh, the, the, the position on this, this that is the most logically consistent is to say don't use it in any of those. And yet at the present time we've lost that battle. Uh, those things are being used uh, in a rather widespread fashion. And so the realistic practical question is uh, what can we accomplish to try to limit the spread of that to increasingly milder conditions which is what I think the thrust of your question uh, is related to. And who decides? At the present time, nobody wants to deal with this. And the consequence of that is that nobody decides and the decision ends up falling in the hands of the individual couple and their physician, uh, which has the potential of sort of turning into what Daniel Kevlis has called homemade eugenics, where you don't have a state-mediated effort uh, to try to optimize the characteristics of one's offspring. Uh, it's done at home uh, by the couple that has the resources to do it. Now, having sort of said those alarming things, I will say that a lot of the scenarios that people put in this particular environment as far as selecting the characteristics of your children are not realistic either. If you have a limited number of embryos, which you normally would do, the likelihood that you could optimize for things like intelligence uh, 
or athletic abilities or height or physical attractiveness, which are very murky and will undoubtedly involve large numbers of genes, even if we can ever identify them at all. Uh, that seems quite scientifically unrealistic because you'd have to have thousands of embryos to have one that had the right combination of all those things. And I suspect, therefore, it'll be technically not very attractive uh, to begin to apply those kinds of tests to those sorts of traits. However, the notion that you might do a screen for single gene disorders, as you're proposing in a pre-implantation setting, if the cost came down and the accuracy was high enough, is perhaps somewhat more realistic. And I don't know. This is an area I think we have not really come up with a plan. Uh, and I don't think the Genome Project by itself can. This is really one of those areas where society as a whole has got to get involved with defining the process by which we will come to some consensus about the limits of the technology if we're able to do so. Um, personally, I think that's the toughest challenge we have ahead of us. I don't think realistically it's there right in front of us today, but it will be in the course of the next five or ten years. And uh, I would be interested in anybody's thoughts uh, in the room about how to get there because it's going to be very contentious. In this country, I suspect that will turn out to be a major agenda item for this new National Bioethics Advisory Commission, and they will either take it on and make some headway with it or it will destroy them. And I think the second possibility is quite likely uh, because when it comes to issues of this sort where people feel passionately on the basis of how they feel about when life begins, it may be very difficult to have a logical discussion that leads to a consensus as opposed to a pitched battle. So I think you put your finger on something very important. I don't mean to dodge the question. I hope you uh, get the sense uh, that I'm not trying to dodge it. I just don't have a terribly good answer. Yeah, hi, Pat Pun, uh, teaching biology in Wheaton College. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming to a Christian high in institution to help us scientifically in terms of uh, enlightening us. A question I have is uh, concerning eugenics and uh, possibly human origins. Uh, how do we as uh, geneticists uh, analyze the human chromosome to say what is standard? Uh, for example, I'm going to give you two examples. The mitochondria, Eve, uh, use a certain pattern, a variation to suggest uh, where does human being ori originate. And then the Y chromosome, Adam, suggests that there is no change in the intron. Uh, the Y chromosome suggests there's a certain pattern of uh, inheritance either. So how does the Human Genome Project decide what is a normal human being? Uh, and then how do we find the right race or whichever person to be the right person to be a standard? You just use yourself or just grab somebody on the street? I don't want anybody to know what's in my sequence. <clears throat> there are no uh, normal standard individuals. That's, uh, the, the, they won't be found. We all have uh, glitches in there somewhere. Uh, in fact, the genome sequence, the first pass through it, will be sort of a patchwork of sequences from a number of individuals, so somewhere in the neighborhood of 10. Uh, those individuals will have had their DNA collected in a fashion which renders them anonymous. So there will be no cover of Newsweek with the 10 people on it whose sequence was used uh, for the Genome Project, nor would you want that if you were one of those people because you'd be having your privacy rather severely invaded. Um, after all, 99% 99.9% of our DNA sequences are identical, all of us in the room. It's the 0.1% that's responsible for variability, and a small, small fraction of that is responsible for disease susceptibility. The, the goal of the Genome Project in this first pass through is not to understand that, but rather to look at the 99.9% .9 that we all have in common which will tell us a lot about normal biology. And then all of the rest of it, trying to figure out how populations are related to each other and what origins you might be able to say uh, come from this ethnic group or that ethnic group by such sequence comparisons, that is a follow-up activity uh, which will happen sometime later. I'm going to take the privilege of the chair and ask the last question. Is there a baldness gene? <laughs> Do you really want to know? No. no. <laughs> Th thank you so much. Thank you.